There are some questions that your mom asks you when you're a kid that are easy to answer. Where were you? Nowhere. <laughs> Who are you with? Eh, nobody. What'd you learn in school today? And by the way, I have the highest respect for teachers. But it's amazing how many kids answer that. Yeah, go ahead, let's get a. That's fine with me. But despite the skill of all of our teachers, ask the average kid, what'd you learn in school today? And the answer is? Nothing. It's amazing. Well, there's one question that's hard to answer when your mom asks you. Where'd that come from? Because now we have an artifact, whatever that is. Money, unfamiliar toy, object. Where'd that come from? And that's a question that has to be answered, whether you're a kid or whether you're a grown-up. Let's get up our first slide here for our sermon in three days. This is the Gabriel Stone. We don't know where it comes from. You see, some things are discovered by archaeologists who will take a photograph and mark exactly where it was found, who dug it up, what layer it was, and then there's stuff that just shows up on the market. And there's always a question, well, can museums show things that they can't figure out where it came from. Can scholars refer to things when they can't say we know where it came from? On the other hand, looking at the stone, recognizing the style of writing and the age that it goes for that handwriting, looking at it, there's a lot that can be learned about it, but I want you to know right away this thing that we call the Gabriel Stone, which was first written about in the year 2008, has been an object of great controversy. As far as we can tell, in the community where the Dead Scroll people lived near Jerusalem, in the Scriptorum, which is where people wrote things down, a scribe settled in for an important task. Normally, the scribe, you guys don't mind if I use your table, right? <laughs> Normally, part of writing would be to, to work on scraping the animal skin, the lamb skin clean, stretching it, curing it, preparing it to be written on as a scroll, and then praying and dipping the pen in the ink and beginning to write. Oh, I'm sorry, i got to go the other direction. Beginning to write. But sometime in the quarter century before Jesus was born, the scribe sat down in front of a stone. A stone is more permanent. A stone has a sense of solidity that says this is really important. But he didn't take a hammer and a little chisel to chisel in the letters because this was urgent. He wrote with ink upon this flattened stone. In, part of it is, is totally illegible, but the parts of the two columns that can be read tells us about a great age that is coming, the day of the Lord, using language very familiar from the prophets that people would have known, about a son of David, a descendant of David, who is a holy one whom the Romans kill. Next slide. And then, and this is where the controversy is, it says, maybe, in three days live, I, Gabriel, command you. Or does it say that? In 2008, this is what was published. By 2010, a whole book was published saying, no, it doesn't say that, it couldn't possibly say that. They misinterpreted the letters. That's fine. My faith is not built upon a discovery like this. But what it does tell us is that people, you know, we sometimes talk, well, the people of God believe this. Nonsense. They, they were just like us. There were so many denominations. There were so many subgroupings. They believed a lot of things. But many of them believed 
that what Isaiah 53 said about a suffering servant was going to come true. And that the path to holiness just might include some suffering. Next slide. Now, when I was in seminary, I learned that this was the earliest depiction of crucifixion. This was after Christianity became legal. This is in the 5th century. Crucifixion is no longer used. They had plenty of other horrible ways to kill people, so they didn't want other people to die the way Jesus did once Christianity was legal. Now, you notice, it's obviously Jesus on the cross with the two thieves, but I don't see a cross and I don't see any nails. It's pretty sanitized. Now, that is probably the first artistic depiction of the crucifixion. Obviously, Mel Gibson hadn't been born yet. But that doesn't mean it was the only way the crucifixion was depicted. There were unartistic ways of doing it. Next slide. All right, this one's hard to see. But fortunately, in the next slide, don't put it up yet, you'll see. What, what is happening is this was found in the slave quarters of the Roman Imperial Palace. Now let's go to the next slide. When you kind of draw it out, you see here is somebody on their knees and a human with a donkey's head being crucified. And it says, Alexaminus worships his god, Alexaminus Sebate Haseon. Well, evidently there was a slave in the slave quarters who was a Christian. And this is what the other slaves thought of him. You're an idiot for worshiping somebody who was crucified. This is not art. This is a piece of graffiti. And it tells us just what Alexaminus's fellow slaves thought of him. Next one. Now, in recent years, some folks have begun looking a little closer at the manuscripts of the New Testament. In this one here, there's the word star on, which means cross. And what somebody has done, not only here and other places, is taken the T, which is the tau from Stauron, and taken the Rho, which is the R, but it looks like a P, sorry to confuse you, and they put them together so that there's this P shape superimposed over the T shape so that in the very word cross in a Christian manuscript, you see somebody hanging on the cross. Next one. Here's another example of it. Whoever does not carry the cross, and you can see they've put a man on the cross, and follow me cannot be my disciple. Next. Now this one's a little harder. You can see that it's been put together. We don't have all the pieces, they're scratched, but there's three different places. And I'm not sure if I can read it that clearly now, but I have it on, let me get it out of my manuscript here just so I can show you what's happening. I know it looks like I'm just talking, but I actually work on this stuff during the week. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be, and it doesn't even use the word cross. You see that little place where it's circled? To, and then it has the picture of Jesus. It doesn't say to be crucified. Uh, so the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha, there they, and once again, the second one, crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to, and it doesn't say the cross, it just shows that picture. So these are examples of, of ways that it was done. Recently, there was another discovery, another piece of graffiti. Let's go to the next slide. And it's just horrible. Here is somebody who is bloated, they have been whipped, and it's just a piece of graffiti making fun of somebody who has been crucified. So even if it wasn't used in art, there were ways to show us that the little piece of jewelry we wear, the word we throw around, actually 
had visual consequences. And I don't blame them for not wanting to put it into art very often because who wants to see that? And therefore, in this passage, where Paul writes to Philippians, and Philippi is a largely Roman city. There is no synagogue. When, G, when Paul goes to Philippi, normally he goes to the synagogue first. But there isn't one. He finds ten women praying by the river because there aren't ten men required for the quorum to have a synagogue service. And so his, his ministry in Philippi begins with people who are outsiders, outside the pale who are very familiar with the Roman methods of execution. And so when he writes to them and he says, Jesus, was in the, who was in the form of God, did not take advantage of this equality. No, he became obedient. He took on the form of a slave. Now you can see the kind of junk that's doodled on slave quarters. Slave is not Slave is not a word they throw around lightly. You know how when you're done, you've been saying, oh, I really slaved all day long. Man, it was hot. It was, I was busy. But of course, you could have stopped whenever you wanted. You could get a drink whenever you wanted. You could have gone to Dairy Queen and got one of those things where even if they turn it upside down, it doesn't, it doesn't flow out and you could just wait. See if a few of you try it this afternoon. When they talked about slave, they meant really slave. People that could be beaten, tortured, and killed with no legal recourse. Jesus takes on the form of a slave and is obedient even to a cross. That sounds like the ultimate loser. That calls to mind the piece of graffiti. Alexaminus worships his God. What an idiot. That's why they put a donkey's head on the body of a human. That is a profound drawing. But what's the result? The result is that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow on the earth and in the heavens, and that every tongue will praise him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. That is the hard thing to get from our perspective, and that is the important thing. When you're willing to stand up in front of the crowd at the coffee house and say, no, not every Muslim is dangerous and wants to kill us. When you're willing to say, not every black person lives on welfare and doesn't ever work. When you're ready to lose friendships and the respect of your community by saying, our church took in refugees a generation ago and these people still love us and we still love them. Why are we afraid of people that are fleeing tyranny when our country is based on fleeing from tyranny and being free women and men? When you're willing to stand up to the lies and suffer the loss that comes by being crucified with a small C, no one's going to nail, nail you to a piece of wood. Nobody is going to whip you to within an inch of your life. But if you say, love is stronger than death, and passion is as fierce as the grave. If you are willing to proclaim the gospel and say, guess what? It's a rough world. And there's ins and outs, and we can't control everything in our lives. And there's a lot of brokenness, and some of us have felt it. But we can still come together and say, we got some folks that made it to 50 years together. 
Not only that, they seem the least likely. Then we are proclaiming the gospel of love. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not for wimps. It's not easy. You may not hang on a cross, but you will suffer loss if you are willing to stand on the side of Jesus, to stand on the side of the poor, to stand on the side of the outcast, to sit down at the table as slaves and as free people and not recognize any of the barriers that the world puts up. That's some ugly artwork up there. A lot uglier than the cleaned up version of Jesus, just, just kind of standing with his arms outstretched. Are you getting tired, sir? Put those arms down anytime you want. Most of us want Jesus our way. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to lose friendships. I don't want to speak the truth. I want to repeat the lies. But you cannot hear the voice saying, in three days, live again. You cannot be resurrected. You cannot be transformed. There cannot be an empty tomb without the cross. That's true for each one of us, and it's been true in different ways. Each one of us has faced and will face a test. For some of it's harder, some of it is not as hard. But at some moment or other, we make a choice. We can run, we can hide, or we can stand by the cross, no matter what the consequences. But as Paul tells the Philippians, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And this is a game in which the clock will never run out on you. And the championship is forever. Amen.